Well, I just noticed that I stole, stole the video from Australia, not Canada, but that's okay. Um, let you know that this leadership summit is everywhere. Anyways, one of my personal heroes, someone who imparted into me the drive I have to see church reach ordinary, everyday people who don't know Jesus, someone who's been a mentor at both a distance and in a number of private one-to-one as well as small group sessions, began to be accused by his former staff team of inappropriate behavior towards the opposite sex. There were multiple women who felt that this pastor had used his power and authority to make them feel incredibly uncomfortable, cross a line of appropriateness, and in the process violate them and violate what it means to be a Christian leader. While the accusations are tame compared to what you often hear when sexual scandal breaks out in the political and church world, uh, the truth is this well-known pastor had crossed the line devoted to the Lord is God. On this side of eternity, this side of heaven, not one of us is ever going to be 100% devoted. It's, it's something to strive for, but you just can't demand it. And I would say to myself, hey there, be careful, highballs. You're not, I'm not, none of us are 100% devoted. We're not quite there. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we're growing in our devotion, but we're not 100%. Even King David, who this passage is all about, he gave his all, but wow, he blew it a lot. And, and while Hybels was preaching this message of 100% devotion, the stories from multiple women demonstrated that he, like many of us, was flawed, that he hadn't quite reached that 100% fully devoted standard yet, particularly when it came to how he related to women who worked closely with him. And I don't say that to downplay the seriousness of the transgressions of a, a leader like Hybels. Women absolutely need to feel safe with the men they work with. But at the same time, we're all messy. It, it's just that our mess isn't quite so newsworthy. And it's out of our mess, what the Bible calls sin, that we surrender our lives fully to Jesus. And it is Jesus who helps us, who empowers us to surrender, who moves us, who helps us move in the right direction. Because really, when you think about it, there is no other way to do the Christian life. I mean, being a half-hearted Christian, being a half-committed follower of Jesus just doesn't really work that well. It just leaves you missing out on the life that Jesus promises can be yours now, let alone forever. You might not ever be 100% devoted follower of Jesus, but you sure can move in that direction. And Jesus wants to empower you to do that. Now, most of you, hey, you know what an oxymoron is, right? It's, kinda, it's a phrase kind of like jumbo shrimp, right? Think about that. Or act naturally or genuine imitation. I've always wondered what that is. Airline food, right? Or adorable cat. Um, uh, government efficiency. Uh, Microsoft works. Actually, I don't think Microsoft Works software exists anymore because it didn't work. Well... 
There's an oxymoron in the Christian world that nobody admits to being. You don't, I don't, but it's a reality in every church, and that's the half-committed Christian. Can there be such a thing as a half-committed Christian? I mean, well, yeah, sure there is. I mean, let's just say it as it is. There are lots of people out there who, who want just enough of Jesus to get them to heaven, enough of Jesus to answer prayer, but not enough to make them radical or fanatical. Okay, in, in my books, radical is good. Fanatical, maybe that's a bit off. Let me explain. Like, like my ninth great grandfather, James Mitchell, he was a fanatic. Uh, a fanatic for Jesus that he tied to the cause of Scottish independence. He, he saw Scottish independence as the only way to religious freedom. And in his fanaticism, he attempted to assassinate the Anglican Archbishop of the day because, in his view, the Anglican Archbishop distorted the truth of the Bible as he worked in tandem with the British government to outlaw the Scottish Covenanter or Presbyterian faith that my ninth great grandfather was a part of. He, he shot at and missed the Archbishop, but he wounded the guy beside him. Mitchell was then hunted down for his crime, and it took them nine years to finally find him and then have him hung. And, and to this day, he remains a folk hero in the Scottish independence movement. But he was a fanatic. I, I think that's the kind of fundamentalist fanatic that some of you are rightfully afraid of. Maybe it's not the assassin for Jesus that you're afraid of, but it's the jerk for Jesus, right? Fanatical, angry, socially inept, and really lacking in love. We need to reject that kind of fanaticism. But radical is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you have some relational intelligence and love thrown in there, something that my ninth, ninth great grandfather seemed to lack. So a loving, relationally intelligent, radical, that's the idea behind a phrase that we've coined here at Fort City. It's a bit of a weird phrase, I understand that. It's the phrase, gracious barbarian. I love that phrase, gracious barbarian, really. It's an oxymoron that doesn't have to be an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron that I think can be made to work because I think it's what we all really want to become, gracious barbarians, if you really think about it. When we talk about fully devoted followers of Jesus here at Fort City, the picture that we have in mind is of a gracious barbarian. Barbarian in the sense that we are raw, passionate people who will work hard, stand strong, fight courageously for the values of God's kingdom, for the message of Jesus. But we will be gracious and sensitive in how we fight. We will love well, and we will love first as we serve Jesus and the people of our city. Gracious barbarians, fully devoted followers of Jesus who love well. So, I hope this doesn't weird you out too much, okay? But... This is what I truly long for. I, I would love to see you become a, a gracious barbarian. I would love to see our church full of gracious barbarians, boldly but sensitively bringing the love of Jesus to our city and world. Because it takes courage. It takes commitment. It, it takes strength to love like Jesus in this world and to help people experience the love of Jesus for themselves. And, and I just yearn to be a gracious barbarian myself. And, and, and maybe I should warn you that if you're going to hang out at Fort City that I'm praying uh, for this, that, that God would pour out his spirit on us in such a way that we would see a movement of gracious barbarians transforming not just this church, but through us touching lives all throughout our city. Because it's going to take spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, gracious barbarians to truly see our city transform for the better. And friends, we can be that people. And I believe that you would love to be that person. And I believe that your family, the people on your street and where you work, would love for you to be that gracious barbarian. Gracious barbarians are awesome to live with because they love boldly. Now, I say all of this to introduce uh, today's Jesus story. We've been looking at a lot of different stories about Jesus or, or things that Jesus said. Uh, we've been doing that since uh, June, and it's been awesome. But before I leap into today's story, let me throw something else out there. Uh, a, a few comments about what's holding us back and becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus who look and love like gracious barbarians. That, that Jesus really wants us to become rather than this kind of half-committed Christian that sometimes we sell out to. Because here's what gets in the way. And actually, it's really a good thing that gets in the way. But in our imperfect sinfulness, uh, you and me included, we, we all got this sin struggle that we deal with. Okay, I'm part of the problem too. And what happens is we latch on to God's good gifts. 
you know, his love, his grace, the power of his presence. And, and we take the good gifts that God gives us and, and then we just leave it there and we go no further. It, it's just natural. It, it's part of the human condition. We're, we're all guilty to some degree or another. What am I talking about? We tend to come to God as consumers rather than as fully devoted worshipers. I mean, we, we, we just do. God, in his grace and mercy, has so much to give us, so much he wants to do in and through us. Many of us come to Jesus because, quite frankly, we had a significant need in our lives. Maybe you felt you were missing something. Life had become too overwhelming to go through without God. You were going through a crisis and you were looking to God to intervene, to help, to rescue. Uh, and God turned up and did an amazing thing, a healing thing in your life. And it was awesome. Some of you felt like you needed the Christian faith, the teachings of Jesus to help you have a stable family life. You, you see Jesus as a positive part of doing family. Well, whatever it was, you came to Jesus because you believed that he could supply what you really needed. And he did. Praise God. There's nothing wrong with that. Our God loves to touch us at our point of need. By the way, that's why we have a prayer team available at the end of every service. We have people of faith who want to take your need to God in prayer and pray in faith with you. And God turns up powerfully week by week by week. It's awesome. Just let our prayer team pray for you, pray with you. It's life changing. But, but here's where many of us get a bit off track. We thought the Christian faith primarily consisted of getting something from Jesus rather than surrendering our lives to Jesus. We assume that Jesus was someone we can add to our life rather than someone to whom we offered our lives. You, you catching my drift? It's not necessarily the most comfortable thing that I say around here, right? And this is nothing new. I mean, Jesus dealt with this when he was on earth, and there's a story in Mark's gospel. It's a, a story that's so important, it, it, it turns up in all four of the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus. And, you know, if it turns up in all four, you know it's something that Jesus put a lot of emphasis on. So this is a story you all really need to know. Jesus is dealing with the apostle Peter. He's the future head of the church. Let, let's look at Mark 8, starting at verse 27. You can follow along on the screen, use your Bible app on your phone or your paper Bible, whatever works for you. Mark writes, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who, who do you say I am? And Peter, Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, as some translators say, you are the Christ. Friends, this is such a big statement. This is such a big deal. The Jewish people have been waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, for over 3,000 years. In the Old Testament scriptures, it said this about the coming Messiah, that he would overthrow the Roman oppressors, that he would right all wrong, stop injustice, put an end to the sin curse that makes such a mess of this world that we live in. And Peter finally says it. Jesus, we recognize that you are that one, that you are Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. And then look at what Jesus says. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days rise again, he spoke plainly about this. This made absolutely no sense to Peter. A Messiah that suffers? Hey, this Christ was supposed to put an end to suffering, not suffer himself. So Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke him. Peter thinks a little correction is order, a little intervention here. Uh, there's a little irony here. He just called Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, and now he thinks he needs to rebuke this Christ and ask him to stop speaking nonsense. Nice move, Peter. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples... He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Ouch. Burn, right? Peter got it right back at him and a whole lot stronger. And by the way, I think this is one of the reasons why we know the Bible is authentic. It just tells the story the way it is. It doesn't sugarcoat things. You, you have the guy who's about to become the head of the church. 
And in the founding documents of this church uh, that Peter helped to start, Jesus calls this new coming leader Satan. Nice. Now, personally, if I were to write a story looking to get support for this new thing called the church, I'm not sure I'd want to include a story of conflict between the leader of this new thing called the church and Jesus, where Jesus called this leader Satan. I mean, I just it's not the way I think I would approach it. Hey, come to our church. Our pastor flunked out of seminary, and then Jesus called him the great Satan. No, I wouldn't say that. But they put that in there because it's true. And, and hey, Jesus didn't just politely take Peter aside, you know, privately to correct him. He did this loud and clear in front of all of the disciples because they needed to hear this too. And then Jesus continues and he now talks to the crowds of people who are around so that they would hear how dumb Peter's statement was. And God then had this put in the Bible for you and me because we're kind of part of that crowd that he's speaking to as well. Then Jesus called the crowd, and that includes us, to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Sometimes following Jesus feels a bit like death. Does that grab you? Excite you? Death? Yeah, maybe not, right? Hey, you might not get what just happened here. What what Jesus just said, take up your cross, was absolutely shocking. That this statement would have been so revolting to the crowds. To you and me, the cross has become a sweet, sentimental symbol of our faith. We decorate our houses with it. We wear it around our necks. We make it out of gold or diamonds even. Think of that cross that some of you wear like this. It would be like a freed American slave wearing a little lynching rope around their neck. Or let's bring it a little closer to home. It would be like an Aboriginal Canadian wearing a stylized bloodied scalp around his neck. I have another line in my family that roots back to the Micmacs in Nova Scotia or Acadia, who the British attempted to wipe out by offering big bucks for Micmac scalps. It's not one of the most uh, fine periods in our history. Really, it was an attempt at genocide. But today, you, you might go into someone's house. This might be more true of Catholic homes than Protestant homes, but many Christian homes, and they have a cross maybe in the kitchen or in their kids' rooms, and you, you don't think anything about it. But imagine, just work with me on this, going into someone's home, and the picture over their dining room table is someone before a firing squad. And then you go into the nursery, and dangling from the mobile uh, above the crib are some little hangman nooses. You're not going to say, oh, man, isn't that sweet? No, you're going to tell your kids, we don't play at that house, okay, guys? We're, we're not going back there, right? By the way, I'm not saying don't wear a cross or decorate your house with a cross. Just make sure you don't lose the shock of what the cross stands for. Jesus uses the image of the cross, the cross that he himself would soon bear, to confront a satanic perversion of our faith. And what is that perversion? It's that if you come to Jesus... If you follow Jesus, you can expect Jesus to remove all hardship from your life. And friends, that just isn't true. But the Apostle Peter, he assumed that the Messiah would end all suffering for God's people. And he's got good reason to believe this. You can find it promised in the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament repeatedly tells us that a Messiah would come and end injustice, right all wrongs, and end suffering. It's there in the book. But that same Old Testament also talked about a servant of God, a Messiah, who God would send to suffer. But this was always confusing to the Jewish people. They couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that the suffering servant and the conquering Christ are the same person. So Peter was just thinking the way most Jewish people thought at the time, And it left people believing what a lot of Christians still believe today, that Jesus came so that I would not have to suffer. And Jesus is going, no, that's not quite right. I am not going to deliver you from all suffering right now, but I'm going to be with you when you suffer. I'm not always going to stop all your pain, but I will use your pain, give meaning to your pain, and use it to bring life and hope to people all over the world. And Jesus says to Peter, until you understand this whole truth, You should stop 
you know, speaking for Jesus. That's why Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. You know, get behind me, Satan. Shut your mouth until you understand this. Today, many followers of Jesus sort of believe that coming to Jesus means that all suffering in your life will end. And if you suffer, ah, man, God's not keeping up his end of the deal. Now, this is actually partially true. When Jesus died on the cross, his death paid the penalty for our sin, and, and his death undid the power of the sin curse that so messes up our lives and does so much damage in our world. In case you didn't notice it, you're, you're actually getting a good theology lesson here, so hang in there, all right? So here's the truth. When Jesus died on the cross, he purchased our wholeness. That's not just spiritual wholeness, but physical wholeness, mental wholeness. It, it includes this planet and our environment, the Apostle Peter talking about Jesus on the cross, quoting the prophet Isaiah, says, by his wounds we are healed. So one of the things that Peter teaches is that there is healing in the atonement, that there is healing because of Jesus' death on the cross. And so we pray for healing. We ask, we seek, we knock. But we won't fully experience healing and wholeness until Christ returns. Still we pray that what Jesus purchased on the cross would break in more and more now. That, that's part of praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's the truth. Praying for healing, praying for wholeness, praying for deliverance. This is our privilege as children of God. Our, our God encourages us to pray, to ask, to seek him. It's, it's awesome. Our, our God delights to answer prayer. So, so let's pray. Let's ask. But the writers of the Bible are equally clear that disease and suffering will not be fully eliminated until Jesus returns. Friends, this side of eternity, we will see heaven. We will see God's kingdom break into this world when we pray. So let's pray. And, you know, every time you see an answer to prayer, you're getting a picture of what a heaven eternity is going to look like. But again, we won't see it fully happen the way we yearn to see it happen until he comes back. Friends, Jesus in his grace, mercy, and love, does hear and answer prayer. But the problem for some of us, that's all we see when we see Jesus. We, we see a genie in a bottle, part therapist, part life coach, personal cheerleader, financial advisor, and yeah, he is all that. But he does not exist primarily for my purposes or your purposes. He does not exist to be at my beck and call. Are you tracking with me? What do you do when the cancer doesn't go into remission and you've prayed and prayed and prayed? Your loved one dies. The marriage doesn't get better. The kids don't come back. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, are you going to leave me too? I mean, that's what people do all the time now when they say, oh, no, I, God can't be loved if this mess is still around, and they leave. And, and Peter says something very interesting. P Peter throws up his hands and says... Where else am I going to go? That might be not the most inspiring response, but where else am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated with all this suffering stuff, but at the end of the day, I'd rather have you and nothing else than anything without you. That's a picture of full devotion. I follow Jesus because of who he is, not just because of what he does for me. Seek God first and let everything else follow. Peter had been so excited about following Jesus when it meant healing and power and popularity. If you remember, Peter walked away from a very lucrative fishing career, but now Jesus is talking about following him into a life of suffering and sacrifice. And so Jesus confronts Peter, and really he's saying the same thing to you and me today that he says to Peter, are you following me because of what you think I will do for you? Are you? Or are you following me just to be with me? Because really, following me means following me through the highs and the lows. It's not so much about what you can get out of it, but who you can be with, Peter. Peter, is there a limit or a condition on your surrender on you being fully devoted to me? Those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus... Here's what we need to understand, and this is an Andy Stanley statement. Salvation is free, it costs us nothing. But following Jesus will eventually cost you something, maybe everything. At some point as you follow Jesus, your desires are going to go one way, and Jesus is going to be leading you in another. It's going to happen. 
And at that point, you have to decide how valuable knowing Jesus personally is to you. Because sometimes, as Jesus is leading your life, he'll, he, he'll ask you to end a relationship that you don't want to end. It's not what God has for you. It's, it's not in alignment with his ways. Maybe he'll call you to follow him into some sort of mission or service. Maybe here at Fort City, maybe somewhere else in the world. He will call you to make a financial sacrifice. Jesus wants to partner with us through our giving to make a difference in the world. It's, it's not because he needs our money. It's because it changes our hearts as we align with what's really important in God's perspective. Jesus, he'll call you to be a forgiver. I, I mean, someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness. But then, did we ever deserve God's forgiveness? He'll nudge you to talk to a friend about Jesus to invite that friend, that family member to church with you and When you see God at work, it brings life to your friend and to you. So awesome to see a friend come to Jesus. And for some of you, it's the call to be baptized, right? If you can't get wet for Jesus, can you really follow him? Okay, some of you said that's a low blow. All right, well, I'll try to temper that, maybe. At some point in time, if you're truly serious about following Jesus, he's going to take you in a direction that's 180 degrees opposite of what you want. And in that moment, you've got to answer the question, did I come to get something from Jesus or to offer myself to Jesus? Do I want something from Jesus or do I just want Jesus? And let me tell you, when you choose to follow Jesus, when you allow him to lead you, you not only get life come eternity, you get life, life to the full now. And in the end, you lose nothing and gain everything when you follow Jesus. What do I mean? Well, that forgiveness you offered that you didn't want to offer, you know what? It just might restore a relationship or at the very least, release you from bitterness. The relationship that you walked away from is going to open up the possibility for a healthy life-giving relationship for you and maybe them. I see this all the time. It's, it's awesome to watch. The ministry you engage in, where you choose to serve here at Fort City or wherever God calls you, it's not only going to bring life to someone else, but it will become a renewal of your faith, maybe even your kids' faith. I mean, serving is life-giving. On the giving front, God takes your financial sacrifice and brings life through it. And not just to the ministries of Fort City that you give to, but in your heart as well. Studies say that people who give consistently are just more content, more happy. They experience a depth to living that those who think they don't have enough never get to experience and just just hang on. And, And in this story, Jesus is really blunt when he says, hey, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for the soul? It just says... It's a matter of values, right? And to follow Jesus ultimately is to find life for your soul. To follow Jesus is to find life to the full now and forever. Sure, it's true. Jesus wants to bless the lives of his followers. But he doesn't want us coming him simply to be a prayer answering machine. He he wants us to come to him so that we would do life with him, so that we would be part of his mission to this world, so that we would actually partner with God to see more of his kingdom come and more of his will done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's what's happening now. Jesus is calling you to follow him. Not as a consumeristic, half-hearted Christian, but as a fully devoted follower. And for the apostle Peter, that meant he too would take up a cross and actually be nailed to it. And when that time came, he asked to be nailed upside down because he didn't think uh, he was worthy to die identically to the way Jesus died. Jesus didn't deliver him from a brutal, violent death. In fact, Jesus may have just led him into it. I mean, it didn't end well for Peter. But then the legacy of Peter is incredible. He is the founding apostle of the church. And the impact of his obedience following Jesus, of his full devotion, you and I today are experienced the fruit of Peter's life, lived well following Jesus. So, sometimes following Jesus feels like death. But it leads to life. Life that can be experienced no other way. And it impacts lives all around you with the life and love of Jesus. People change. 
I don't know if you sense this, but I'm personally gripped by all this big time. And my plea and my question for you is, will you say to Jesus today, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to give my life fully to you. Will you help me in my weakness to give my life fully to you, to become that gracious barbarian? Will you use me to serve your purposes and make a difference even in this city like you use Peter? So let's pray and kind of make this kind of commitment to Jesus. And then I'll encourage you, read your Bible, listen to Jesus, let him lead you into the full, abundant, incredible life he has for you, even when the road is rough and doesn't go quite the way you'd like it to go. Take the words that I pray and then pray them on your own as your prayer of personal commitment. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you came into this world so that I could get to know and follow you. Just, just thank him for the connection you have with Jesus. Thank you that you died on the cross to wipe away my sin, to purchase my wholeness, my healing, my mental and physical health. And I thank you for the privilege of prayer. That as I pray, I get to see your kingdom come to Fort McMurray as it is in heaven. Thank you for prayer. Honor my prayers. But today, I declare that I have decided to follow you in the highs and the lows that the life I truly yearn to live can only be found following you. So today, I surrender my life to you. Will you do that? Just tell him, I surrender. And ask him, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Be with me and lead me through the good and the bad. Oh yeah, I pray, heal me, deliver me, make me whole. That even as I struggle, be with me. And then use me to bring your life and love to others. I pray in Jesus' name.